All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another session of the Phys Ed Summit 2014. Um, we're so glad that you could join us today for our conference. And, you know, just without you, you know, this conference wouldn't happen. And we're thankful that you want to be engaged and part of it. Uh, the back channel on this presentation is already jumping, and it, that's awesome. So uh, just a few reminders that the video feed stops. Just check your Tozzle for an update because, you know, sometimes we're using tech, things happen, right? And like a barking dog in the background of my video, so my bad. Um, so if that happens, um, hang tight and I'll relay you information. I'm in the back channel there, so I'll, I'll be in conversation um, as well. So um, also another reminder, don't forget about your badges. Keep earning those badges. Um, there's a lot of different ones that you can get. Let's all play the game together. So. Also, I'll talk about Flipgrid a little bit more afterwards. But with that being said, um, we are lucky to have Mike Ginicola with us today, who's going to talk about gamification. And I'm just going to hand it over to, to Mike. Mike, go for it, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're presenting on. All right. Thank you, Colin. Um, well, hi, everyone. I'm Mike Ginicola. I uh, teach K-6 to PE and grades 5 and 6 health on the East Coast, USA, in Connecticut. This is year 20 for me, so I've been doing it for quite a while. And uh, I got onto social media a couple years ago and really uh, accidentally found out about gamification. Saw some pictures on Twitter, and uh, I was really drawn in. I've been someone who loved playing video games most of my life and really had to explore and see more of uh, what it was all about. So I've had this journey now to seeing how powerful it is and really wanted to share it out this past year as much as I can because I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings about it and it keeps some people from uh, getting into the idea and the concept and it's kind of a shame because it's really powerful. So uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen and start our presentation uh, again if any questions i told colin uh, interrupt at any time i'm really happy to answer anything along the way so feel free to interrupt if you have a question i may have the answer for you uh, usually so right here my opening screen really uh, i think hits upon the power of what gamification can be so a couple of great ideas that we'll touch upon throughout the presentation All right, so gamification. One of the things that I found out was people have no idea what it is. You think it's playing video games in class. Uh, and that's kind of kept a lot of folks from uh, dipping their toes in the water and seeing what it's all about. But the, the main idea is you're taking all the best parts of video games, things that you know keep people going back to them, and adding that to something that's not a video game. It could be a business, consumerism, and education, our field right here. And you're really just taking the parts and putting it into uh, what the kids are doing in education. So they're not playing video games necessarily. Uh, they are actually like living the video game. So, why should we care about this? Well, some interesting data I wanted to share. You've got, you know, let's say, 325 million Americans. I don't have the worldwide numbers for all of our um, other friends out there, and I apologize, but 183 million active gamers in the U.S. So we're talking you know, 55 to 60% of every American plays video games actively. Uh, you got, look at that, $5.5 billion invested in the market by next year it's now surpassed uh, the movie industry, which is incredible. Uh, they put more money into the intros for video games than sometimes the trailers they do for the movies. Uh, you have, I thought it was interesting seeing how many CEOs and CFOs, first of all, have the, the time at work to, to game, unlike most of us, but they just do that as a break. You've got 80% of learners in some studies they've shown that would be far more productive if they had some gamification in the system. Uh, so really, it, it's a huge idea. 
that started you know, not even 10 years ago. Ooh, and then put this in there because I didn't want to forget to mention it. Uh, closing in on half of all gamers are actually girls and females. So a lot of people think that there's this uh, stereotype that it's just for boys, but really it's uh, just as many girls and also uh, mostly adults over kids. There's actually a majority of adults because we're the ones that have all the money. Now, uh, game-based learning is really what we do in PE naturally. We're using games to get the kids to learn whatever it is that we're trying to teach them, whatever content it is. Whereas gamification is really living in the game itself. So it's a little bit different. Now the game-based learning that a lot of people get confused on is using software, video games for kids to learn like math or reading or writing in the classroom. So that would be game-based learning where they're using the game to learn, whereas they're not actually living inside um, the game environment itself. So with game-based learning, you're learning from playing a game, whereas with us in gamification, you're actually a part of the game system itself. Uh, usually game-based learning, and now this is not always, especially in PE, but you have the predefined rules and the goals that are set. Whereas in gamification, it's often a little more responsive. So it can change based on the needs of the kids. Uh, Game-based learning often assumes you know, that one size fits all. Whereas with gamification, it really, it really pushes the thought that all different learners are different. And of course, we know that in, in phys ed, we are one of the best at modifying it and differentiating the instruction naturally too. Uh, so in game-based learning, it's often a pre-designed challenge, whereas with gamification, it can be responsive. So you see like this theme here where uh, gamification can really react well to um, changes in the environment. Uh, game-based learning is often teacher-directed, and I know we are now pushing back quite a bit on that in our field with uh, student choice and voice and having them take ownership more often, uh, which gamification does really well. So. Um, so here's a classic example. You have Kahoot and quizzes, which a lot of people think is gamification and it, it can be, but really that would be considered game-based learning. Uh, you have them doing quizzes uh, and it's like a game show to go over and review the material. Whereas something like a class craft or even, even a class dojo uh, where they're actually have characters in the game and they get points and level up and get experience is more uh, gamification. So there is a difference, uh, but both of them are pretty powerful. So I just wanna make sure that everyone understood the difference in those two. Hey Mike, I've got a question for you yeah. from Brian. Um, and he's wondering, how did you first implement gamification in one class um, at a particular grade level? Um, you may have that later in your presentation, but I uh, wanted to let you know. Yeah, I definitely do. I wanna share out some examples of how to use it in a real simple format and also uh, you know, getting a little more deeper into it. So I'm definitely gonna share that a little bit later in the session, so I promise. Sounds good, man, thanks, keep it up. All right, um, so here we have something that, I've had a few people share this with me and say, wow, you know, uh, PE is fun, why would you need any extra gimmicks like gamification? And I really took that as a challenge because th there's so much more than, than just gamification, making things fun. Uh, there's this video games themselves are incredible tools for helping with a growth mindset. Like the whole idea of video games is you're going to fail, pick yourself up, dust off or respawn somewhere and continue on, on the journey uh, to getting towards the end. There's uh, just such a powerful message there for students, I think. And I think that's one of the draws for video games is really uh, failure is never final really in most video games. Uh, it is often a student centered that voice and choice in a lot of gamification uh, that's really powerful that students are given more responsibility. Uh, something that, that does kind of scare some educators I've noticed is releasing some of that authority and responsibility and giving the students uh, more voice and choice in the learning. Um, Another great thing about gamification is as these kids are 
hitting the little mini targets or the goals and leveling up or achieving the small objectives that you have, it's really an assessment. You're, you're assessing them. It's just a way to reframe it. Uh, so the kids are not really thinking of it in a traditional sense, but hey, I want to get to this level. And really that reframing ha has a, a huge potential for anything in education where you take the narrative in there and now they're they're getting XP experience points instead of like an A, B or C or traditional grading or a one to four with standards based, uh, but their, their characters are leveling up and it's just a different way of looking at grades because school itself is naturally uh, gamified. School is gamification, just really horribly implemented. When the kids are getting grades and they have status and all that from it, that's really gamification. It's just not done well. Um, the great thing about gamification is your, your low effort kids, the non-participants, um, those that are at risk, they really tend to be drawn to uh, systems like this because they often know video games pretty well. It kind of lowers the threat level for them. When I did class craft last year, I had a few kids that I never thought would really participate as much as they did. And it was because I had changed everything in our environment for them. And then finally, you know, the big thing right now, the autonomy, mastery, purpose, uh, our motivations and video games hit all of them naturally and gamification does too. You're giving kids the power to change uh, their learning. Uh, they're definitely working on our content and skills through this. They're mastering our content and you have to give them the purpose for why and everything that you do. And that really is the thing that pushes gamification to the next level. It's always having a narrative or a why, uh, reframing what they're doing. All right, so a little bit more on the why here. Uh, everyone has these natural desires. I'm just gonna click through them all and open them up at the same time. So some folks like to, it's like the different learner types. You have people that like to have achievement, kids that like to compete, just like to um, be good at something, kids that want to express themselves. You have the socializers and kids that like to have status. So most video games, if they're done well, will bring as many of these in as possible. And in your lessons, uh, you may already do this without even realizing it, but you bring a lot of this in naturally, like competition. Hey, that's a pretty natural uh, thing to worry about in physical education, the kids achieving things and mastery. So a lot of this is naturally in there. It's just a, a way of kind of changing the way you and the students look at it. So it's really amazing stuff. Now, my huge uh, idea with gamification and the biggest pushback that I ever got was about you know motivation. So for folks that don't know, uh, you have intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Uh, and basically intrinsic is everything that you would feel internally uh, why you like to do something more because you enjoy it versus what people think of as extrinsic or external uh, stimuli you do it because you want to look better or you want the object everything that's impacted on the outside but the thing that is really interesting and i had to put this comic in here because sometimes things are just really not done well when they over focus on uh, the extrinsic. So you have this tile grout company and they just wanted to put badges out there because for a while everyone thought that you put badges out there and you were gonna be successful with gamification. And a lot of uh, the early adopters and even ed in education, people that tried it early on didn't really do well with it um, and gave up on it because it was really misunderstood. So really you have intrinsic versus extrinsic, but in reality, we're always a flowing balance of both. Every decision that you make is intrinsic and extrinsic in focus. There's always both. Really, they're never separate entities. So it's kind of the misunderstanding right there. So, um, you know, when you're playing sports, you want kids to love playing sports, but yeah, they're gonna really enjoy the game, but there's always other motivators. There's, uh, I'm being social with my friends, the status that it gives them with their friends, uh, do you get trophies, uh, possibly money in your future? So they're always coexisting and uh, always, always in balance. And the interesting thing is a lot of research shows that everyone is different with their needs. 
So there are some people who are uh, just built to exceed by the extrinsic. So the intrinsic to them naturally um, has, is, doesn't have the same impact as the extrinsic. So uh, really some of the top athletes in the world, they did research on and studies and that extrinsic was really what got them to the top of the game. And of course, it's always in a balance. It's just how much of each, you know, it's sort of like people that have slow and fast twitch muscles. You always have both, but it's some people are more inclined to have one or the other in abundance. So the cool thing is with intrinsic motivation, uh, it is something that can be contagious. Other kids can learn the idea and foster it through others in the environment. So, you know, oftentimes the extrinsic is there first to draw kids in, to get them into the door of learning. So you got the carrot on a stick, but as they experience it, they will oftentimes then start to grow a larger amount of the intrinsic for what you're doing. They can see it in other kids and, and uh, see how much they enjoy something and that can draw them in. And that's really powerful too. So sometimes it's just a journey of getting to where we want them to be. Uh, interestingly enough, we know we have choice and voice mentioned it already many times here and powerful stuff, but quite often that is an extrinsic motivator. Uh, so when we think of extrinsic, sometimes people will say it's it's negative or it will not be a long-term uh, motivator. Honestly, that's one of the most powerful motivators out there is, is giving kids the voice and choice to do things. Do you want them to have a choice of 10 different objects for their underhand tossing or, or tossing activity? Let them discover and journey with what they want to use. So that is you know an extrinsic motivator right there. They're choosing externally what they want to use. But at the same time, they're getting joy from that choice. So again, you have a balance. Um, and now, interestingly, look at our lives. Like I'll show you a little bit later uh, what, how gamification is really embedded in everything that we do, but it never has to go away. Like I'm an adult, and I still will you know, play, uh, use uh, Zombies Run to help motivate myself to go running a little bit more. So it's a gamified app that helps me out every day. Yeah, I mean, I do really enjoy running, but having that there also helps out as well. So really extrinsic motivators never go away in our lives. So it's not like when you, you say, all right, well, if you take away the badges and stuff from students, they're not gonna want to continue with that um, content anymore. But really the external and extrinsic motivators never will leave anyone's lives uh, for the most part. All right, so gamification, where is it? Is it around you right now? I, you know, I have a three and a five-year-old, and one of them was enjoying watching Chuggington, this TV show about these trains who learn how to do different tasks. And at the end of every episode, they, they get badges, magnetic badges, on the side of their car to signify that they had that achievement. So even from a really young age, a lot of times you know, kids are seeing the gamification and how it works because you know these companies know that it's a really powerful tool. So even kids are often, uh, even with Mickey Mouse or uh, Jake and the Neverland Pirates where they're getting their gold coins, the balloons at the end. So it's a pretty neat concept that even kids are getting into. So now where is it in our lives? Uh, number one, we all love them. Store loyalty cards, credit cards, getting the points, Starbucks, earning your next free drink. Uh, almost everyone, unless you are smarter than the average person and you don't use credit cards, uh, definitely has gamification in your life just through these loyalty programs. That everyone really enjoys and i recently just put my points in for for pampers for the pampers program for diapers that we're slowly trying to get our our three-year-old out of uh, it's really everywhere around us uh, you have your people sharing on twitter all the time their fitbit steps for the day and uh, pokemon go itself so people are trying to achieve things in these apps and really right there you're kind of sharing socially your status and how awesome you're doing and competing with others so anytime someone shares 
how many steps they took for the day. It's kind of an invitation to socially be involved with gamification with them. Uh, social media, you have the, all the, you know, Facebook originally was the big, I want everyone to be friends with me. You have Twitter, how many followers do you have? There's a lot of uh, competition and status involved in the system and throughout social media. It's just a part of how, how it works. And really when you're going for all those tools, and this is the genius behind uh, Facebook and, and everything like it is it's got this built-in gamification that's stealthy that people don't realize uh, that, that keeps us coming back for more. Uh, interestingly enough, we are tied with you know, a lot of sports and activities and hobbies and really gamification came from video games. Video games, the idea came from board games and, and board games really were the next logical step um, after you know, physical competition and sports. So sports really kind of started it all you know, probably thousands of years ago. And even today, when you're watching sports, you have the trophies and rankings and points. Uh, that is a hugely gamified uh, type of event. So sports themselves are naturally gamified. And then finally, you know, I was in the military and you have the, the scouts for the kids, all of that, the ranks and the points in the system, the way it works with the rewards and the, and the medals, uh, that's obviously gamification right there. And so again, there's really no way to avoid uh, having gamification in your life unless you avoid all of these things, which I don't know many PE teachers that uh, do. All right, so now we're gonna move on to you know, the original question. How do we do this? How do you use gamification in PE? You know, most of us have our kids once, twice a week if we're lucky. Me, once a week for 40 minutes, and it's tough. So now, four things that we want to kind of think about, and really also what helps gamification be so powerful is you want to have feedback always happening with the kids. And that's just natural and good teaching. You want to always share with your students how well they're doing. And gamification naturally helps them with that. So you always have those clear goals, the objectives, um, and how to play the game. So the students will see, and the best part about gamification is kind of having small mini goals, mini targets that they get to level by level, just like in a video game where you get to the checkpoint and then the next part of the game starts so that you start thinking of it as checkpoints and not this big hard adventure, but just small chunks of the puzzle, total reframing of the mind. Uh, and speaking of reframing, you have a compelling narrative. You know, let's look at as simple as getting kindergartners to practice their locomotor skills around the room. So, hey, kindergartners, we're gonna practice skipping and galloping and hopping around the room. Let's compare that to, all right, we're gonna go on an imagination walk in the jungle and we're gonna practice being different types of animals and their movements. You know, they have the exact same thing is happening in class, but one has this narrative, and in this case, pretty simple, but something that often works with kindergartners versus, hey, we're just going to practice these skills. So with everything in our lives, the narrative can change everything, just reframing uh, how you look at it. And now, uh, the one thing that's really important with all content, but especially in gamification, is making sure that it, the challenge is there for each student, but it should be achievable. So if it's not really something that they're going to be able to accomplish people lose interest naturally so uh, really when and i've played some video games that have failed in that area when you just kind of give up because after a while it's just too hard so you do want it to be challenging make them work at it but they should be able to uh, be successful so here is the first thing i ever saw on twitter for gamification and uh, basically it was just jump rope. I didn't really do it well. I was basically just copying at the time. You'll see that on my whiteboard. I wrote down the ranks that they would get, how many jumps they had to get to. I think this was third grade. I changed it for every grade level and uh, their stripes. So the rank that they would get and then the actual, you know, the badge itself would be the stripes here. 
and the level of power. So they would actually get a privilege or a power they can use. Um, cause we usually, this is for short ropes, single ropes. And usually I do long ropes or group ropes after. So they would then get to pick a teammate or be a class helper based on how far they got. And what really drew me into gamification was right here, grade six, because I teach K to six. In grade six, they're stuck in wanting to be in middle school in my district, but they're not, unfortunately. So getting them motivated is not easy. And I have never seen them sweat as much as I ever, you know, in, in probably the 18 years before that as when I incorporated this simple little thing into the lesson. So doing the single ropes and practicing. Hey, Mike. Um, yeah. Can I ask, this is a question for me. Um, Are you allowed to ask questions? I'm doing it, man. I'm, okay. I'm making my own rules. <laughs> All so, right, um, my question is, so like the first day compared to gamification to when you implemented it later, like you're talking about student engagement, which I've noticed too when I implement it. So, yeah. um, like, have you noticed the same amount of engagement or is that something that you're constantly modifying to increase and keep that engagement where it is? Yeah, definitely. I, with gamification, it, it can get stale. Like if you have. Uh, let's say you do something with grades four to six and they started in grade four and now grade five and six, they're seeing the same thing. I, they're going to get a little bored. So you do want to change it up every once in a while. And like, I'm, this is, I'm showing you right here. It's just a simple activity within a lesson. It's not even a full lesson, just a simple, uh, small activity in the lesson that you're doing. And, uh, you know, something like this can always be tweaked and changed easily and always keep the kids, um, going. Um, really with, with the large, like if you're going to do something for a whole unit, you'd want to kind of change that up every year a little bit, maybe the theme or what have you. Um, but for simple, easy gamification like this, where it's just an activity or just a single lesson, you should be good to go with this every year. I think because for me, the kids would only see this once or twice a year because I don't get to revisit a whole bunch seeing them 32 times, uh, unfortunately, so that they would be almost brand new for them the next year. Awesome. Okay. Hey, thanks for that. And then someone's uh, wanting, was curious about the level up powers. Uh, what do they mean? What does backup helper mean? Those types of things. Yep. Yep. So in this, if they were to reach the, the general status, they would basically get to pick their whole uh, long rope group. So they're two friends to go with them. Um, if they got it to major level, I would pick one and they would pick one. Uh, if they made it to sergeant, they would be the class helper. And I had to put backup helper in there just in case I didn't have enough others uh, to reach the certain levels. So definitely a learning experience whenever you do this. And I had some kids that were very, very, they're, they really uh, are so cognitive in their thinking strategically with these things. They're like, well, what if, uh, what if a major has a general or what if a general picks a major first? Can they then, can the major then pick the second teammate? So you, really got to stay on your toes with kids because they will definitely uh, test the limits, which is great because I, I love that myself. So often you have to right there kind of reward their thinking. Like, yeah, if you pick a major or if a major, you know, picks a general, that general can then, you know, pick another person because they would have two picks. So the major would have been done and I would have picked the next one. But since they picked the general, who does have an extra pick, they got to have another person on their team that, that was their choice. So sometimes you have some interesting dialogue there with students and I, I really enjoy that. Great, thanks man. Keep it rolling. Got a lot of engagements on this back channel here. All right, great. So yeah, I, I consider this not you know novice level uh, on a whiteboard or a chart. You can write it up anywhere. You have uh, stuff, the goals and mastery and it's like we're running time is kind of running out so i'm going to move through this a little bit more but just see that you have mastery and status and you know right here badges and achievements and now i kind of failed in this in copying someone else initially because i was new to it and i didn't really have stripes for them or anything to designate what rank they were That's something that i would have changed at the time uh, everything else works pretty well for the most part but another thing is having them have to witness each other they can't just say oh i got the 50. Uh, others they had to be in small groups and they had to have the witnesses agree that you know they got to that level and it worked out pretty well you know it, it is an honor system all right so now moving on uh, a little bit later on i had someone share this out where you created it with uh 
and I would consider this more moderate level gamification because you would either print out the poster or somehow uh, display it, make it a little bit better for the kids using Comic Life or uh, some publisher app. So here you have kids are doing uh, the activity, which is doing it like badminton. And, and I love the graphic on this because it really draws kids in. So as they uh, win a certain number of times, they get a power, which kind of tilts uh, the fairness level off and helps them out more. So others have to work even harder uh, to get them off the court, which I thought was really neat. So you want to have that displayed for them to be able to see and remember because they're not going to remember everything. So again, you have the mastery of the skills working in with their status. Or are, how high up are they? Are they level five? Um, giving them a chance to change the equipment. They get to choose what they want to use at a certain uh, point. So it's really powerful stuff. Uh, the kids almost kind of forget that they're even there for the content and learning and they just tear right through it uh, just because they're, they're so focused on a lot of the other, which is pretty neat. All right, now here is table ball. I'm not sure if everyone knows this game where you're striking a ball onto a table and it has to bounce off uh, with the hands. And now this is a little bit more advanced because you have them looking at two things at once. It is something that you probably want to have projected maybe um, onto a, a whiteboard or a movie screen. So they have to uh, win so many times to get points. And now this one has them actually wearing different vests to show what their levels are, which is a pretty neat concept. And you, you, you would think that this would take a lot of time, but really the kids are off and running on their own. Again, it's autonomous and they are taking care of it, really not wasting any time. It all happens very quickly. Um, you know, but it is nice sometimes that they pause and we'll look up there and, and read through it and, and kind of remember where they are with the learning. So here that they get those special powers again, it's really not all that different than the, the slide before, uh, just that it's a little more advanced. Uh, so they do have all the same stuff. You'll see a lot of the mastery again, everything has them working well, but now the kids that like status or to achieve, um, you're hitting different learner types all the time. Hey, Mike, we got some more questions here, Roland. Uh, All right. So um, there's a question a few minutes ago. Maybe I'll come back to that one. But we had a question about frustration, you know, from students and not getting on um, certain levels. Um, like, you know, we know that, that this motivates students, but do you see a frustration that occurs with students that aren't reaching a certain level? And, um, and then, you know, I'm sure that's a teachable moment. So just curious how what, – what you do in those situations yeah that's a really good question and, and that does come up sometimes uh really the thing is you know with anything else having uh, a culture built with with your students uh, different levels of achievement uh, one of our one of some of the standards that we have our grade level outcomes through shape uh, specifically talk about getting kids to understand uh, first of all the differences between them and accepting others at a different level higher or lower so you should always really be having those conversations with the kids but uh, with, with the gamification here what's really neat is you, you would think that some of them that are not really as skilled as others would get frustrated but I've really not noticed that very much myself uh, I tend to let them often choose their own groups quickly uh, in situations like this and they will either willingly choose to go with a friend who is of a higher skill level and they understand that going in. So I'm not forcing them into that situation. That, that was something that they chose to do. Um, or they were, they're all choosing certain friends because they know they are of the same skill level and they can challenge each other more. So a lot of it is in the, in the choice and the voice part where they are choosing their situation. And now if something does happen, uh, and a kid is not happy with one of the groups or someone's not really doing well and, and they feel frustrated by it, I, I will you know, have a conversation with them and, and see if they want to switch places with another group. And um, oftentimes it really just is not an issue, at least in, in my situation, but it might be because I really focus the first month on social and personal responsibility. And we really, I use responsive classroom and just teaching them about all the different 
uh, levels that they're going to be at compared to one another. Talk about how they're at different reading levels. You have people that are on grade level, above grade level, below grade level, and really kind of showing them that it's the same thing in PE. People are above and below grade level all the time, and um, you just have to kind of coexist together. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I really think so. And it's all about the community in which you build, right, for your class. So um, you know what I mean? I think that a, a group of students um, w within the right community can um, adapt to any, you know, various situations. And uh, it's awesome to hear how, how you prompt them and get ready for it. Right, definitely. I'm gonna see if I didn't pop out here. It's fine. Say hi, everybody. I feel like I haven't popped out enough and, and um, seen everyone. So yeah, the culture is extremely important. You uh, are you getting Connor? Are you guys getting double feedback? We're not getting double feedback. So sorry. I mean, there is a delay right now for some reason, Mike. But um, if you need to take your headphones out and just Keep, keep it rolling, man. All right, so can you hear me well? Yeah. Well, we, we're going to have to have you, like, what I meant by take your headphones out is, like, take your headphones out of your ear but leave them plugged in, and that might help from you not hearing yourself or me speak when you're trying to talk. So sorry about the delay there, buddy. Yeah, no problem. All right. That's funny how it's coming through. All right, so now here we have uh, the next step up, which I think is a better way to do do your content in uh, in a way that doesn't cause frustrations. All right, sorry, I'm still having a lot of feedback issues for a second. Let me pop out of. All right, let me try. So hey, Mike. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Hey, one thing. Oh, no, we're good. You know what I did? I closed the tozzle down, and then it seems all good. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, all right. I apologize, everybody. So now with with uh, Classcraft, it's kind of a built-in software system that I started using last year, where the kids will um, have a character that they create, like a mage or a healer or a fighter, and they have certain powers that they can get in class. A lot of it is customized by you where uh, they may have a mage may have the power to teleport and if they want to use their power during class they would just um, push the button on the laptop that their power is used and be able to switch places with someone during an activity or during stations maybe they could uh, skip a station if they were a warrior with a scout power or mages with sticky webs they could stay at a station twice in a row if they really wanted to repeat that station really gives them a lot of uh, control in the learning, which was pretty neat. And basically the parents can see this. It's like Class Dojo, but more advanced. Um, and basically they get experience points that you set up through the class content. Quizzes can be set up on here where they defeat a monster, a dragon or something, or a boss. And it's pretty intensive, not, not that hard to learn, but something you, you wanna do set up over the summer. Um, or maybe set up later in the year to not start until later and give yourself some time to get used to it. But really they get levels and as they level up, they get more powers and gold that they can use to change the outfits on their characters. And they love um, changing their outfits and getting these pets that they can have floating next to them. So this was the, the level that I was at where uh, really they're, the frustration levels wouldn't be there anyways because they are really just going through your normal content um, and trying to get to the highest level they can be. And they really enjoy it. And you can do like a random event that at the beginning of class where the kids can make the teacher dance to a certain song if you want or a, a random student would have to dance to a song. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with this. Some of the powers can be the they could have the power to change the song during class. So there's a lot of opportunities here to give the kids some um, ownership in the learning. Uh, I know some people have tried this last year along with me. I know Dave Carney had um, tried it and some other folks. So 
definitely uh, the challenge with it is you have 40 minutes with your kids. So trying to streamline that. But other than that, it's pretty neat. This is more of a view of uh, like an all year theme. So they were superheroes. So I will show you uh, on oh, the best thing about having like a larger gamification theme is, and you can see I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan is you give them side quests like in a video game. So I would give on my YouTube channel them opportunities to do things at home that would get them more experience points in class for their character. Uh, so it could be the parents will show me a video of them uh, being actively engaged in an after school sport or activity. Uh, could be them. I, I did Pokemon Go. I had them videotape catching a Pokemon and I, I would give them experience points based on the Pokemon they caught. I had parents contacting me with these pictures and videos coming in in the morning and visiting me. It was a great community tool, that's for sure. Um, but it really got the kids doing a lot more at home uh, on their own, which I thought was very powerful. So I really thought that was a cool part of this was getting the kids active outside of school and getting the parents involved. All right. So this is admittedly a little more extreme i had last summer to put it together um not really for everyone but i put together a trailer for the kids to uh, start off the school year where they were they were superheroes that were pulled out of the timeline and every month we were uh, challenging the uh, boss who they have to kind of figure out throughout the year how, how they got sent to this other place where they lost their powers and through pe they were getting their powers back Hey, Mike, so we can't hear the, the, uh, the, the yeah. audio. So yeah, I mean, if you, there we go.
All right. So that was awesome, dude. Hey, uh, we've got about five minutes. Uh, Mike and I have to transition into a different presentation that's specific to um, Plicker Magnets here in a moment. But, uh, Mike, I, I know you probably have other things to say, but I, ha I had another question. Would you yep. like me to, to uh, ask that question to you right now, or you want to hold off, bud? Yeah, definitely. Let me say that, you know what, the video there, that was obviously, like, extreme. Uh, so that was me having too much time in the summer and not <laughs> something I would expect everyone else to do. <laughs> no, it, it was great. So, um, and everyone that's asking questions right now, just remember that, um, Mike will have an opportunity to, uh, come back into this tozzle and ask them in a little bit. But, uh, we had a question about screen time, Mike. Um, and as far as there's like a two questions. So. Like, how do you handle uh, parents that want to limit screen time? And then on top of that, you know, there are certain populations, um, you know, in the United States that haven't been exposed to certain concepts or game gamifying at all. Um, so for, like, uh, we have an example here. As an example, oops, sorry. Someone keeps typing. So as an example, last year um, someone had a student uh, an undergrad student that had never heard of Pokemon Go. Um, so, you know, not not every part of the United States has heard of that. Does that does that make sense? So we might have may not have time to answer that. But that's all yeah. right. But. No, definitely. the The power is that they don't have to know what Pokemon Go is if they're coming to your class. A lot of the kids do, and that excitement is you know contagious. However, it's the parts of the game that you're using like in the beginning of the year i did a pokemon go fitness game that was mostly from ross chakri and and the kids most of them had you know, maybe no idea what pokemon itself was but they were able to collect these pokemon by doing the fitness activities and, and practicing their tossing skills and you think that it was the newest thing in their life that they've ever seen uh this is a new fitness didn't exist anymore they were they were playing pokemon go even if they had never e seen the app over you know, the summer when it was really big. So it was really not about the actual games themselves. And a lot of it, as I've shown you, really is not much screen time. I mean, in your class, they're seeing it on the, on the screen or the whiteboard. Uh, but really, a lot of it is no tech at all, kind of a low tech situation. And you're still fine with a whiteboard. And at home, they, you know, I, I only did those intro videos in the beginning to help them out. It wasn't like something we did all year. Cool. You know, I think it's awesome. And that video is awesome. Where did you, where did you get like all the, uh, you know, you obviously made it in a program like iMovie or something similar, but where did you get all the graphics and all of that? Was that something that you just, uh, Google foo search skills, lots and lots of searching, uh, not always easy, but you, you find Ninja Turtles and type in fitness and you'd be surprised what comes up. That's awesome, so, man. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Any, any other questions? I know we are winding down and getting ready for uh, part two of the yeah. Colin Mike so, show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there are several, but I guess my recommendation would be like some of them are more detailed and you can go back in there and answer them for sure as they keep rolling around. Cause I, unfortunately I wasn't able to get to every single question, which I apologize, but mm -hmm. um, anyone can always yeah. contact me, you know, right here in the Tazel. Uh, I'm always available Twitter, Facebook on the, on the PE group the P essential page, feel free to reach out. And there's a lot of us that do gamify. Colin has experience with it. Um, you, if you get onto Voxer, we'd be happy to help you out on the app and talk to us. There, there's really endless resources. There's a lot of folks in, in the PE that are doing it. So we'd be happy to help you. Yes. So thanks Mike so much for joining us for this first part of uh, part one, part two is what I'd call it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. So everyone stay tuned for uh, Mike's second presentation here. We're going to take a 10 minute break. We're going to be rolling in there. Keep your questions going in the tozzle, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being part of this presentation and the Phys Ed Summit. And I want to remind you too that we're using something new this year called Flipgrid, which allows you to uh, reflect uh, via video. And um, I, I would definitely encourage you to hop on there. There's a link inside the Tazel there. So we'll be chatting soon. And uh, thanks, Mike. That was awesome, dude. And thank you for moderating. Really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thank you very much.